Bom dia a todos, bem-vindos. Vamos chegando. Chegando aí a nossa penúltima palestra do curso de introdução à engenharia de som. E no, na palestra de hoje a gente vai ter a apresentação do Ernesto Corte, que vai se apresentar melhor logo mais, mas é nosso colega da Universidade Nacional de San Juan, na Argentina. Não é nem um pouquinho perto lá de Buenos Aires, eu acho que ele vai contar para a gente onde fica San Juan e, e contar também um pouco sobre a estrutura do, do sistema de, de financiamento lá, que é o CONICET. Bom, com isso dito, uh, Ernesto, thank you very much for accepting the invitation. Uh, we're very glad uh, that you could make it and uh, with no further uh, delay, please, uh, our virtual floor is yours. Okay, I, I'm hearing you a little uh, low, but thank you, thank you very much for the introduction. And, and well, I'm very happy, very glad to be in this uh, series of talk. I've seen them, they're very, very good, uh, such a good level. <laughs> I hope I, I can be at that level. Uh, and well congratulations for that uh, for the series and well as you said uh, i think you said that in portuguese i'm talking about acoustics of uh, an amplified music spaces um, i work in the university of san juan uh, as a professor and i uh, i am also a researcher at conicet uh, the system is a little different than in other countries in Latin America. Uh, CONICET uh, uh, have researchers that can be just researchers. They are not required to, to be professors or to teach or to be with students. But uh, many of us are also professors at the university. Uh, CONICET allowed us to have a second position at, at the university, and depending on how how the time is distributed, some discounts are uh, apply, uh, applies or, or does not. And okay, I work in the Institute of Automation, Instituto de Automática in Spanish. Uh, that depends on the on these two institutions, the National University of San Juan and the uh, CONICET, that is the National Scientific and Technical Research Council of Argentina. And by the time I'm doing a, a joint project with the uh, Institute for Hearing Technology and Acoustics, uh, ITA, uh, the name has changed a few time ago, so uh, it's where Bruno did his, his PhD. Um, well, uh, the project is uh, financed by the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation. It is a program called uh, Hero Foster. It's, they have two programs uh, this team in this with the same name. One is for uh, postdoctoral students, and the other one is for experienced researchers. And I think in Brazil you, there is a different name. The program is pretty much the same, but the name is, is different. Um, well, so uh, Bruno asked me, as I think it's, it's the, the idea in the series, to tell you how did I get uh, in, into acoustics. And I think that in my case, everything started here in this hall. This is a concert hall in the city where I live now, that is the city where I, I was born, that is San Juan, Argentina. And the concert hall is called Auditorio Juan Victoria. Uh, I, I was there, uh, let's say my parents are not very used to classical music. So uh, one day, I don't know why, uh, I think an uncle or a friend tell us, okay, let's go to a concert and we go there. I was four years old. I think I even get sleep but, but by the age, no? Four years old is, yeah very junk for a concert of one hour 
but I it was an experience that I think that was the cue. I didn't know what was that uh, experience, what was so, so wonderful there. I was thinking the instruments, but now I think the acoustics of this room was uh, catching my, my attention. And well, then I, I studied uh, classical guitar. I was in some rock bands, some, and nowadays I am in a core. Uh, and well, I think music is, is important in acoustics, especially in room, room acoustics and musical acoustics. So, well, here we have a, a little distorted map to, to tell you the, the rest of the story. Uh, the red point is uh, San Juan. Uh, I was thinking to study music composition or something like that until someone told me, hey, in Santiago de Chile, there is something called uh, acoustics engineering. And I was good in mathematics. I like very much music and I think, okay, this is what I want to do. So I moved to Santiago de Chile and studied there. Uh, acoustics engineering uh, in the Univers Technical University of Chile. Ex-alumni from there uh, call it uh, BIPRO. And we had there many teachers that uh, received his, their education in Valdivia. That is a very uh, interesting center of acoustics in the south of, of Chile. Uh, well, then about JR200. Sorry? No. Okay, about uh, JR2006, I moved to Buenos Aires and there I started to work in a, a firm that manufactures acoustical materials uh, called Sonoflex. They distribute in, in all Latin America, I think. Uh, I'm not sure if they distribute in Brazil, but I know other parts of Latin America they do. And I started to attend to the IRAM, that is the National Standardization Institute. And I am still attending the, those meetings of the Acoustics and Electroacoustics Committee. A couple of years after that, I moved to Rosario, uh, that is about 300 kilometers from Buenos Aires to the north. To the, in the National University of Rosario, I did my PhD with Professor Villara. Um, I did some internships, uh, actually an internship in Italy, in the Laboratorio per il Controllo del Ambiente Construito, the Università de la Campania, Luigi Mabitelli. Uh, this is in the province of Caserta, and it's very near to Napoli. Uh, and well, the host there was Professor Rigi Maffei. I was there about six months, and I carried out there a part of my PhD thesis. Uh, my PhD thesis is on environmental acoustics, so we are not going to talk very much on, on this, but well. then I came back to Rosario, I graduated, and I went uh, I decided to uh, get back to, to San Juan and there I started a postdoc position at Inout. And after that, I started, I applied for the research career. And now I am a researcher of the research career of Conisa. And being here in San Juan, I did an internship with the Acoustics Today magazine from the Acoustical Society of America. I didn't move to, to the States. I, I just attended two uh, to meetings, uh, but the main internship was virtual from San Juan. And part of the result of this internship are some interviews with the South American acousticians that you uh, can see if you want, if you type the, uh, Acoustics Today interview with South American acoustician to get uh, quickly to the to the web. And more recently, I am carrying out a joint project with 
uh, ETA. Here I forgot the, the age because it was the, the former name, Institute for Technische Acoustik. Uh, in Germany, in Aachen, the RBTH uh, Aachen University. And this project is, uh, I have to do two different states. I have done the, the first part and the second part is postponed because of the pandemic, but I hope we can uh, go on very soon. So, well, this is where I am now. And uh, Bruno also asked me to, Talk to you about the, the institution in which I work. It is the Institute of Automation. And we call it Inout. And as many academic institutions, the goals uh, are, are three or based on three goals uh, that are research and technological development, knowledge and technology transfer, and human resource formation. And as you may know, the, there are important links, links between these three goals. Our team is about 30 researchers, seven professionals and technicians, two administrative, and about 20 PhD students, active PhD students. Uh, let me tell you about these professionals and, and technicians. This is a very interesting team because they can do some mechanical, like mechanics things, uh, some electronics, but they also can do 3D printing, uh, some signal processing, some programming. So it's it's a very, very good team to support <coughs> uh, research and, and on the, the goals of our institute. And our financial resources are the institutional projects, national, the, most of them are nation, national. Um, from the CONICET, the National University of San Juan, of course, but there are other agencies like the uh, Agency for the National uh, Scientific and Technological Promotion. We have also other institutions at provincial level. The CECITI is the secretary uh, for science, research, technology, and innovation in San Juan. <coughs> and Transfers, transfers counterpart are also important financial resources. When we do a counterpart, uh, when we do a, a transfer, we receive a counterpart. Sometimes it is equipment service, and sometimes it is a, a monetary counterpart. Um, well, and also international collaboration and mobility grants are, are welcome. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the human resource formation. I want to tell you about the, the program uh, of our institute that is the doctorate in engineering of control systems. We have also a master uh, degree in, in control systems, but uh, I'm going to talk about the, the doctorate in this case. Uh, it is uh, evaluated in the best category of the Argentine Commission for University Evaluation and Accreditation. It has three categories. Well. Uh, the, our program is in the, the best of them. And we have two double degree agreements. One of them is with the University of Valladolid in Spain, and the other one is with the Universidad de Federal de do Espíritu Santo. Uh, the, the idea is that if you do the PhD and some courses in one, you have to do courses in San Juan and in Valladolid or the UFES and some other requirements, and then you get the degree from both institutions. And there are cases of success of these two agreements. Uh, we have about 63 graduates, 20 candidates, and from these uh, 83 people, 14 of them uh, get uh, grants from DAAD, that is the German Academic Exchange service and 45 of them from CONICET. Uh, it is a very interesting program from DAD. Uh, in our institute, we, we can have one candidate 
uh, per year. The, the program is for, um, four years, but it can enter one per year of uh, Latin American students that want to carry out this program. Uh, but it is not for all Latin American countries, and suddenly Brazil is one of the, the excluded, the excluded uh, countries of this program. Uh, but in case you are interested, you can apply for the Latin American uh, programs of CONICET. The main topics of our doctorate are robotics, control system, and signal processing. And we have some proposals of uh, acoustics and robotics, acoustics and control systems, and acoustics and signal processing. And well, this is all the introduction. Uh, let's talk uh, a little bit about the the topic that, that is, I think it, it will be interesting. Uh, the idea is to give a, a brief review by talking a little bit about the, the open topics and the challenges of uh, acoustics engineering or ingeniería de son uh, for room acoustics. And then I'm going to talk to you about the, the projects in which uh, I am involved. And at the end, I, I will show you uh, a couple of, of rooms that in which uh, we was involved. So the challenges of acoustics engineering for room acoustics are can be separated in many ways. This is one of them. The challenges in one of the most important challenges in design is to provide to provide reflections that optimize the perceived attributes. And of course, we want to avoid echoes noise and synthetic uh, vibrations. And also uh, the challenge is to provide good stage acoustics. And in this, in stage acoustics is one of the projects I'm going to talk uh, in, in the next slides. And well, another important challenge is what I call conform standards and conform ears. I mean, the design should be meant to conform ears. We want to hear good music in the in the room. But uh, what are the standards for? Well, we have a good design meant for ears, and we want this design to survive in many phases across the building process. So it has to survive from a blueprint that can be done by a team or a group of, of people, a project that can be done by another group of people, and then the construction uh, can be another, a third group, fourth group do the inspection, then the tuning. So we have many phases and we have a, a design made for years, but it is hard to, to maintain this design based on how it should be here, especially if the room is not uh, build yet. So in this aspect, standards are important. The current standards are very criticized nowadays, and especially the ones uh, related with measurements. And one of the main critics is that they use omnidirectional sources. And in the case of microphones, they use a couple of microphones arise of a couple of microphones. Some directivity is there in the microphones, but uh, can be more accurate. And well, directional sources have been developed and new measurements are being developed. There are many works from Tapioloki or uh, uh, are some of them in which he uses directional sources to measure room parameters or descriptors. There are by Matthew Niels in the state. And well, there are many projects also uh, in measurements with microphones, uh, microphone arise between six and 32 or even more microphones. And these measurements allow 
us to study the decay of some energy in space and to see how the energy, the direction of arrival of the energy in space. Um, well, finally, uh, regarding evaluation, the challenges also exist. Regarding calculation, the last round robin uh, carried out in ETA a couple of years ago, they saw some difficulties in modeling certain phenomena. So there is an, an open topic there and uh, things that can be done there. And regarding organization, the state it is a lot, a lot of advance in oralization, but there are some issues still uh, unresolved in regarding calibration. And we want to contribute there in, in the possibility of improving calibration. And I'm going to talk a little bit on that too. So let's go to the, the projects themselves. Uh, let me talk to you a little bit on the project on stage acoustics at ETA. Uh, it is about the effects of sound diffusion on stage acoustics. And for that purpose, the idea is to do some experiments using virtual scenarios. Uh, so we have two musicians or in this, in this uh, graph, but this, it can be applied to many musicians. Each of them isolated in an anechoic environment and they play their instruments and they hear their own instruments and the instruments of the other musicians as if they were in a real uh, situation, in a real stage. The idea is to uh, make them play in different stages and use some questionnaires to research how these modifications can modify their, their perceived attributes. Um, well, there are many questionnaires that we can apply, and there are some of them that are very, very developed. Uh, but the main idea is to work on uh, hearing themselves from musicians and hearing others. These are very important factors in stage acoustics. And well, the processing uh, for each listener is doing for by one of these blocks that we are going to see in this slide. This block is the orange one, is um, carried out with a, a software developed by Pita2 that is a virtual acoustics. This software solves in real time the, it's the convolution, but we can say the, the oralization process. Yes, we have the signal from the musician and we can do the oralization as if they were in a room, but we need a model of the room. This model of the room is made by another software uh, made by ETA called Raven. And in the case of the, the same musician that is playing and listening, we don't use the direct sound, we skip the direct sound because uh, we are using open headphones. So we assume that they, are, they have no isolation. And well, so in this case, musician one plays the virtual acoustic systems applies the, the modifications of the room. This sign, this signal is added to the signal of the other musicians, and this is the the signal that uh, you will hear. Uh, well, here we have uh, some a, a couple of examples. They will not hear very good in in Zoom, so I I left the this slide to to Bruno. He can share it with you. Uh, the idea is that here you have a string quartet, uh, and you are hearing in the cellist position. So you have these two audios that you can uh, listen after after the presentation, and the green color in these scans is a mater an absorptive material is like an open window 
the black is reflecting material, it's a, a real material, and color uh, orange is a diffusive material. Just to, to have a, a, an oral idea the, of what we are trying to research. It's a very, very pilot study. Uh, we have to see what kind of modifications are we going to study in, in our experiments. And well, it is another project. It is a project on directional sources that we are carrying out here in, at Inout. Uh, this project is in a collaboration with the Teatro del Bicentenario, that is um, an institution, a, a mixed institution. It is uh, part private, uh, part uh, public. Um, they have a building with many rooms, and one of these rooms is the one you see in the, the photo that is a very nice opera theater, Italian style. Uh, well, the project, uh, in this project, we will build the source and carry out some validation measurements, but the idea is that we can do a further project and to study the the descriptors for stage acoustics, especially in this kind, kind of stage that we have a pitch and, and the stage. So this is something that has been, oh, at least I, I haven't seen it many publications on that. Um, and well, the idea is to have a source that is uh, a dodecahedron, uh, because we can have a source that can be very similar to the to the actual omnidirectional sources, but we can go to a, to some directivity sources by the codification in, uh, the codification actually in uh, spherical harmonics. And with twelve loudspeakers, we can go up to a second order. And this means that the resolution of our directivity pattern will be similar to the to the red line in this um, polar plot that you see in the, in the right. Uh, of course, more precision will be better, but we decided to stop there because we wanted to have the dodecahedron to have the the typical omnisource in the same uh, array of, of loudspeakers. And well, this is the state of advance of the physical uh, source. The, uh, the first, the, the graphs in the upper part are 3D models. And then as we can, as perhaps you, you can see, we printed the, the pentagons. We tried to make it with Fiber board, but uh, then we compare it with some proofs in, in printing and 3D printing. And we decided that 3D printing will be better because we also get the know how and we can then have a, a small source or different uh, modifications of this source. Uh, well, so we also did some modeling uh, and or simulations of the the response, the frequency response. In the left, you see the frequency response, the magnitude, the phase, and group delay. Um, and there are several uh, directions separated among them about. Uh, five degrees. And uh, in red, these are the limits of ISO uh, 3392. And as you see, if you, uh, in this part, seeing the, the whole frequency response, we have some problems here in 100 kilohertz and beyond that. Um, but when you see this in octave bands, it seems to be 
in the limits be, uh, it does uh, okay it is without passing the, the limits so uh, this is one of the critics that the standard receives and that is why perhaps we will have to to complement our source with the small one to avoid these problems here in one thousand kilohertz and, and one thousand hertz and, and beyond that. Um, well, I also want to talk a, a little bit on calibration issues and what we can uh, contribute in this topic. Uh, well, one important parameter of room acoustics is uh, source strength that is called, it's always uh, called G. Uh, it is a parameter that estimates the amount of amplification that the room or for a combination of the uh, source and the receiver can can do reg uh, regarding to the uh, omnidirectional source in measured at the distance of three meters. So the, you need for that um, calibrated uh, sound source, but in case you don't have this calibrated sound source, you can apply a rectangular window. This is from an article that, that is uh, from CAD, by CATS in 215, I think, um, 2015. And well, you have to isolate the direct sound and you can have an estimation of G using this uh, isolated uh, direct sound. Uh, we try to see how it uh, performs if instead of a rectangular uh, window, we use shaped windows. And we use uh, all these shapes that, that you see here. And we apply this method to a set of data that we have the impulse responses and the real um, values of, of G in different frequencies. And we saw that it improves a little bit. The improve is, is not a um, very large improve, but uh, in mid frequencies, the use of shaped windows could improve in 0, 1 dB in uh, low frequencies, it improves a, a little bit more. Um, in high frequencies, something like 0 .2. Uh, and well, you can see the article there. Uh, and in what I am working right now is uh, in the errors of a uh, in neuralization, the errors in calibration due to distance estimations. When you have to estimate the distance, you have to know the acoustic center of the source. The acoustic center of the source is not a point. It depends on frequency. It can be a moving point that depends on frequency or many points you want. So if you do an estimation of the distance, with a unique number, you are having a, a, an error. Um, for instance, you have an anechoic signal that you measure at a distance, a distance uh, R2. And then you have a virtual listener at the distance R1. And you will have an error in both estimations in the estimation of the distance of the anechoic signal and in the distance of the estimation of the virtual listener. So these relative distances uh, are plotted in the X and Y uh, axis in the graph on the right. And you see there the sound pressure level error. Uh, and if you have a signal of a trumpet recorded in an echo chamber at, let's say, a distance of one meter, you can have a, an error of about 
30 centimeters. So you, you could have an error of 30%, uh, 30%. And this can traduce in an error in the calibration in terms of sound pressure level, uh, in terms of sound pressure level, sorry, uh, of four to five dB. And this is important. Uh, we are not yet in, uh, in uh, contributing in how to improve this, we are just describing this. Okay. And well, to conclude, and um, see, we are time to conclude. These are two rooms in which we were involved. The first one, the one in the left, is just a 3D model. It is a room that uh, we participated in the, the design. And well, it is actually a, a conference rooms or a multipurpose rooms because it, uh, but both of them are multipurpose rooms because they are meant for conference rooms, but they allow also some music performance. Uh, of course, chamber ensembles uh, or small ensembles. And well, you see here that we have the 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 ceiling, this uh, uh, panel of this surface that directs the sound from the sources to the last or to the rear part of the audience, to the last rows of the audience. But it actually also provides uh, some lateral reflections, some second order lateral reflections. And this idea was also made in the other room, the one in the right. But this one, the case was totally different. Uh, we get involved in this uh, in this room when it was already built. They, it didn't have any cladding, uh, any seat. The, it didn't have the carpet, but the, the main part of the room was already built. And as you can see there, it is a very curved wall in the left. And this caused a lot of focalizations, uh, colorations, and um, fluttering echoes. Uh, it was it was not it was a, a big challenge to to work with this room. But finally, we used some uh, diffusors and absorption. These are membrane absorptions. Uh, and we did some measurements, and we had musicians there, and we conducted some questionnaires. And well, we succeeded. Uh, it was a, a difficult uh, work. Well, it's not more time to, to tell you more about it, but we can perhaps come back in the, in the questions. Agradecimientos para su atención. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a lot of questions. Thank you very much, Ernesto. Great talk. Uh, I do have one quick question to start with regarding the 3D, 3D printed uh, loudspeaker that you showed us. Uh, did, did you have it built completely already? And, the, and if yes, did you have any problems with the ceiling, the air ceiling of it? With the sorry, with the air ceiling, was it airtight? Uh, no, no, no. Uh, Jan, we the photos are from yesterday. <laughs> So no, okay. we so haven't finished it. <laughs> it. But the idea is to seal it. Uh, it is a material, it's the same material that, that is used in loudspeakers to seal them. Uh, it's uh, I mean, kind of the, rubber. The, the, the tree, not, not in between the plates, but this one uh, tetahedron that you, that you 3D print. Is it airtight? Because sometimes the, the the printer is not when when it places the the material there is air that can go through. That's what I'm. Ah uh, 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 no 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 it is. Uh, 
it is not uh, there is no air uh, passing through the the brain uh, yeah okay um, so I'm okay. waiting if there's uh, any questions come uh, coming up uh, one other thing that I, I, I just wanted to clarify when you were presenting the first uh, experiment that you're doing at ETA was uh, are the two musicians playing si simultaneously or uh, uh, yes they yes they are in in real time perhaps I, I say it very quickly uh, they are at the same time and they have some visual feedback it is it is hard to have the audio in real time so having video in real time will be also or much difficult because you have more data there but some visual feedback of the other musician will be will be there and we don't have um an animated view, we have just a photograph in this first approach because the problem of uh, getting all these, the, the audio for all these uh, working in real time is uh, a challenging yeah. work. So we simplify the other parts of the, of the work. But, but that means they are, there are two guys, two musicians, each one in its own uh, anechoic chamber or listening room yes. and then the system is connecting them yes mm -hmm. this is the idea cool <laughs> not, not easy to find yeah. like two two rooms like that you had to build that right yes uh, they're the, actually they won't be anechoic anechoic the you know the the facilities of ita it will be the the here in booth or uh -huh. they are not full anechoic but they have uh, they are tr with very low reverberation mm -hmm. there is one question uh, in this regard asking how do you deal with the crosstalk but i'm guessing you're using lo uh, headphones the whole time aren't you? yes 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 we are using headphones and Yes, the, the rooms are isolated, so we don't have a crosstalk there. Good. I have a question. Yep. So thanks, Ernesto, for the nice uh, presentation. Um, I'm wondering, uh, in your uh, experience as uh, like modeling the room, uh, when, when we model the room, we, we have to input and specify uh, material properties. And often uh, these material properties are measured in a reverberation room, for instance. Mm -hmm. And they carry uh, information of uh, the size of the sample that is being measured because you have edge diffraction effects. So um, how, how do you see this problem arising in the simulations uh, and with what the models of geometric acoustics or wave acoustics can handle in terms of uh, accounting for those effects? Uh, yes, this is a very good question. Uh, I am actually uh, not working on, on this particular problem, but I think that uh, just some solution could be the, the one that you suggest uh, working with uh, wave acoustics uh, or it can be some kind of modeling i think that software are uh, commercial software or most of the available software are not doing uh, much on that but uh, actually they do some little efforts to, to tackle that this problem um, that is to to work with the uh, the borders of the surfaces and to change the diffusion in the or the scattering in the borders regarding the scattering in the center of the of the surfaces 
this is one possibility but i think it's an, an open topic <laughs> is it i think it is because uh, when you measure you are actually measuring some something with a given size and then you yeah. model it is another size and then if the the, the acoustic model of the room uh, even if it takes it into account the input data in the first place is not uh, it is something with a given size so it is it's kind of tricky to to to, to fix it and it's a very hard problem i was wondering if you had uh, uh, yes. an opinion well, you strong have opinion about this no i don't have a very strong opinion but the, you have i have some ideas i've seen some publication some work on, on that and when you have measurements for instance of uh, seatings uh, they used to do different borders so you can use these different coefficients in your model for instance uh, yeah some it's an I think it's a known problem uh, some possibilities to tackle this problem exist but uh, just I haven't seen a very uh, how you can say uh, strong or deep study on that thanks uh, Ernest, uh, uh, I, I was asking about crosstalk, but I got uh, I understood it wrong from the I, I read it wrong. But the the question was actually dealing with the loudspeaker. So how are you are going to avoid crosstalk between the loudspeakers in your loudspeaker array? And if you're planning to put some uh, absorber inside the the array? Uh, yes, yes, uh, we are planning to put absorption inside of the of the, the, the carry room, uh, and also we can do some uh, digital signal processing to improve the crosstalk uh, problems that we will have there. So they, they are there, there are some known models we have to to see them. Uh, to advance in, in uh, implementing them, but there are some of them, uh, there are documentation on how to apply these crosstalk filters. You know? And are, are they, are, are you planning to have uh, all the, the loudspeakers drive independently or driven independently, or are they going to be? Yes, yes, of course. Single input? Uh, but no no they will be driven independently uh, you can do it one by one also this is another possibility and then uh, you can construct the directivity in post-processing mm -hmm. this is a possibility too but the, in our project we are trying to to drive them independently with 12 separate channels and Some, 12 amplifiers and uh, simultaneously and uh, independently uh, yeah both of them because it depends on the the measurement campaign if you have more time you can do it independently but if you have a short time you must do it all of them at the same time yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, i guess uh, now it's clear that I got the question wrong here at the at the chat. Will, do you have uh, any comment you would like to make? Yes, uh, Ernesto, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I was wondering what was the uh, most difficult thing when you are um, kind of analyzing the, the systems you have showed us? The more most difficult uh, I don't know the convolutions the well, responses I, I think something that that was very difficult for me, for me and now I uh, I think I arrived to a solution uh, is the problem to calibrate the system 
for hearing others. Calibrate the system for hearing oneself is more or less uh, simple because the the instrument is in the but because we are hearing the direct sound and the the distance of the instrument to the ears is always the same but when you are hearing others the distance from the instrument to the ears depends on the on the configuration so this this part was uh, hard and i hope we can publish uh, the these results uh, but i think we we have there uh, a solution to that problem I see. Yeah, uh, we are always trying to figure out uh, ideas to, cir to cir circumvent problems, right? I think it's it's very nice that you, uh, we we can use, for example, Raven to to do some part of the calculations. I think it's a great part that at least we don't have to code again or or, or I don't know uh, search on that. So uh, start it off from the very from yeah the from scratch. scratch. So in that in that sense, we pray for from from the guys and and we thank them from for these tools. Uh, thank you for muchas gracias for for your comment. Yeah, obrigado. Thank you. Okay, no, no. Uh, I think you was going to conclude now. Do we have some more more questions? Students, anybody would like to open up the mic? From the YouTube, there's uh, no further questions. Okay, so I guess we have concluded. Uh, before that, uh, that, that last space that you were showing which is actually the one uh, you there which is curved right so yeah. you said uh, flutter echo is always a, a huge problem and I, I know you told us what you had to do to get it right but the, the big question is why did they start from the <laughs> beginning why did they do it curve and <laughs> Asymmetrical was it because the architect found it was it looked good or was there a, a strong uh, restriction that they had to do it like that? I'm yes, no, I, I think I'm, it, is, uh, it, it is. It is something is, that was it a, a lack of uh, acoustic education for the architect or? or uh, okay, no, I, I think it has to do with the the whole project they have several other rooms and in this uh, wall they have a, a very nice a very nice uh, i know it's uh, circulation it's a part that connects uh, two rooms uh, that are meant for for expositions and it looks very nice on the other side but uh -huh. <laughs> just in this side of the room it, it causes these problems uh, and yes of course the the good thing should be uh, what they had to do was to include an acoustician before doing a line <laughs> i think but well uh, we uh, we were uh, involved in the project at least in in the end part and we could improve this this problem and it is and, and nowadays it is actually not a problem uh, it was if, if you did the cladding uh, without diffusion or i think it would have been a problem but uh, it could be solved yeah. But as a, it would be easier if you were included in the beginning of the project <laughs> and not, yeah. it probably would be much cheaper if you were thinking about that in the very beginning, right? Yes, yes, but I think, it, I, I think it's a problem. I, I'm, I think it should happen in Brazil too and <laughs> in the rest of the world. It's yeah, we, a problem a... That, that happens. Yeah. 
our second talk was from uh from our colleague from poland and she was telling us how it's the same thing in poland i guess it's the same thing in the whole world and we have a, a, an, an exact mirror of this room here uh with the curved sidewall uh one of the auditoriums <laughs> in the university so. okay okay kind of rings a bell this <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, at the end it can be sold and perhaps it also looks nice mm -hmm. uh, but yes it is or is it we one can suggest other kind of solutions in the in the first steps in the in the blueprint in the project no no uh, it is hard to work when it is already built <laughs> mm -hmm. then you can all you can only make bunch of the corrections right but yeah great uh i think that's that's it we've reached the our time anyways uh, once again Ernesto, i wanted to thank you very much for taking the time to share your work with us to tell us about your university uh, there are, i think now more students know about you and you might have someone knocking your door in the in the future as well oh i hope so <laughs> and thank you very much for the invitation and and congratulations once again i think that the, the series is it's great, so well, congratulations. Thanks. Hope to see you uh, personally in not a very long time. Guys, just to conclude, let's give a hand of applause to Ernesto. Thank you. Bye bye, Ernesto. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Take care. Ciao. Bye. Oh, William, how are you? Bye.